Thanks, Kim, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many friends here today. A really wonderful event. And as I, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how much things have changed in a relatively short period of time in human terms. 40 years for IFPRI, but maybe 50, 60 for the Green Revolution and the transformation that we've seen. And I'm particularly glad to be doing this now um, at this anniversary when in the U.S. government we have embraced so much of what IFPRI has done in the President's uh, Feed the Future initiative. And it's, we've learned so much and we've re-engaged and so it's very gratifying to be able to speak from that perspective. So it's been a time of amazing progress. Countries like Ethiopia and Bangladesh, whose ministers share are, are here, uh, transitioned from food crises to, that affected millions to rapid growth in agriculture. Uh, every, many people here remember when we thought that South Asia was going to literally starve, and that didn't happen. Uh, but the fear of that and the opportunity to do something about it really led to the establishment of the International Agricultural Research System. And then I think also just to see it accelerating with respect to higher expectations. We achieved the poverty and hunger goals laid out in the MDGs. I think many people didn't think we would do that when they first were adopted. And now we hear that the world is expected to be free of extreme poverty in perhaps less than 20 years. I think. Bill Gates says something around 2030, and some are even more ambitious. So it's a, it's a time of tremendous change, and it's a great privilege, I think, for all of us to be part of it. So thinking about the uh, IFPRI, I can't help but think about IFPRI in the context of the CGIAR and its importance in the evolution of that system. In the early days, the focus really was, as my first boss at AID, Niall Brady, used to say, the pile of rice. And, and the, the coming on of IFPRI, maybe 10 years later, in the mid-1970s, after Erie and Simmet and a few others were there, I think reflected a maturing in the understanding of how we were going to solve the problem of hunger and undernutrition. And uh, I think these were two facts that were critical in this regard. One is that success in agriculture demanded attention to food and agricultural policy environment. It wasn't just the pile of rice. And then the second thing was that agriculture needed to be seen as a driver of poverty reduction and broad-based inclusive economic growth. And IFPRI's been a key part of shaping and driving these debates and the broadening of the understanding. And I, I really want to uh, take my hat off to John Miller, uh, who as uh, one of the early DGs here at IFPRI, and a little plug for the home team, a chief economist at USAID, uh, made such tremendous contributions to our understanding of the dynamics um, of, of this agricultural growth and transformation process and its impacts on poverty and hunger. So by the 1980s, when I came to AID, it was really a heyday for agriculture investment in the agency. About half of our funding was going into what we used to call ag, rural development, and nutrition. But there were clouds on the horizon, and some of you might remember that was also the time of the Uruguay rounds and concerns about food gluts in Europe and the US and large stocks and low prices. And uh, for a while, uh, before very long, we saw huge cuts in support to agriculture. In USAID, for example, in the first few years of the 90s, 90% 90 drop we saw in our funding through our missions to agricultural development. We were able to sustain our work with the universities and our work with the CGIAR, albeit at lower levels. Um, so what became clear, though, was that Africa was not participating in this global era of good feelings about food and hunger. It was still a, a very critical concern there. And I think it was IFPRI that did so much work to make a visible, rigorous, and, and convincing case that we had to continue to invest in agriculture and food security, and that gluts in food gluts in the producing countries in the north or places like Argentina and Australia were not reason to walk away from our agricultural investments, and, and we uh, quite the contrary. And I think, for example, I remember how helpful it was to have IFPRI. Uh, show us how our investment internationally was paying off in terms of U.S. agriculture, and that's still important. We still need to keep our eye on this. This is a global effort, and everybody wins. So I also want to uh, 
uh, attest to the leadership of Pear during this time. He, he was in charge with the 2020 effort that IFPRI did such a fantastic job on really doing an inclusive uh, vision of this whole transformation process and really understanding so many dimensions of it. Um, he also, uh, I think, was critical in helping make the case for continued investment in Africa and very importantly for reconnecting agriculture and nutrition which is something that we have embraced in Feed the Future, and that's, I think, keeping that human face, understanding at the end of the day that why we invest in this is because we want people to be well, to thrive, to have a full and, and uh, life with their full potential. Uh, if, if pre uh, uh, was, I mean, sorry, you gotta turn the page here. Um, it was also, I think, during the, the uh, middle of the last decade that uh, Joachim von Braun uh, continued to lead IFPRI at a time when uh, donor interest in Africa was re-emerging and I think the forging of a really um, uh, ambitious research program to address the needs of that region in particular. I want to thank Dr. Braun, von Braun for his leadership there. Uh, during a time when, frankly, many people were running away from agriculture. Remember, as recently as 2005, 2006, our, our funding was at its lowest point ever. So now, very different situation. We have Schengen, very glad to have you at the leadership here. And IFPRI has really continued to push the envelope, the Women's Empowerment Index, the Global in Agriculture, the Global Hunger Index. These are helping us make the case and, and at USAID, we rely very heavily on IFPRI's work to, to sustain our effort. And uh, IFPRI has continued, I think, to have an incredible impact on decision makers. Uh, we know this translates into an impact on the poor, and that's why we do it. But I have to say, I always feel a lot of self-interest when we're supporting IFPRI because they help us do our job so much better. And that's, I'm not just speaking for USAID, I think I'm speaking for everyone in the, the donor and uh, the, the multilateral development banks, et cetera, that community. So um, now, some new challenges. We're looking to a time when uh, hunger and poverty may, in its extreme forms, may be a thing of the past. And, and that's going to pose new challenges for us. Uh, what each of us can do to stay focused on that goal, even while perhaps, I'm not saying this will happen for sure, complacency may start to emerge. So I think IFPRI is going to have a very important role in helping us not become complacent, in, in showing that we cannot flag in our efforts, that we have to sustain this. And, and expand the gains. And I, I, I'm very confident based on these 40 years of tremendous achievement and success and partnership all over the world that, that Schengen, that, that you and your colleagues at IFPRI are going to continue to lead us towards eventual uh, achievement of these goals. Well, thank you very much and congratulations.